Hi everyone, and thanks for tuning in to this roundtable discussion. My name is Dr. Rebecca Stark, and I'm an OBGYN and also president of our Cleveland Clinic Avon Hospital. Today we'll be talking about some of the symptoms that can accompany menopause and perimenopause, specifically hot flashes and night sweats, which are considered vasomotor symptoms, meaning that they're symptoms that affect the blood vessels. These symptoms can wreak havoc on the lives of people going through perimenopause and menopause, affecting not only their physical health, but their mental health as well. I'm joined by three of my very esteemed colleagues in healthcare who have significant experience in this field. Dr. Pellin Batur is a women's health specialist and professor of gynecology and reproductive health. She's a certified menopause provider who works closely with international menopause medical societies. Dr. Nancy Foldveri Schaefer is a sleep specialist and director of the Sleep Disorder Center and staff in the Epilepsy Center at Cleveland Clinic. She is also a professor of medicine. And Dr. Adele Vigura is a psychiatrist and director of the Women's Mental Health Research Program here at Cleveland Clinic. I'd like to begin with a brief description of vasomotor symptoms. Dr. Batur, what can you tell us about them? What are hot flashes? What are night sweats? And what's happening in the body when we experience them? Yeah, so vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, we call them different things, but they're essentially a sensation of heat. Uh, throughout our body that may or may not be associated with sweating. Uh, most often people feel it you know, from their chest on up, but it can uh, impact many different body regions. And everybody's experience is a little bit different. Uh, and how bothersome it is can be very different from person to person as well. And these may actually also be associated with some palpitations, heart racing type symptoms. Um, and it, what's thought to be causing them, you know, the temperature regulator in our brain the thermostat is in the hypothalamus, smack dab in the middle of the brain. And oftentimes when estrogen drops, there, that thermostat gets screwed up, where the body senses that it's, the temperature is too high for some reason, it tries to cool you down by flushing or by sweating. Um, but many, op many often just at an inopportune time. For sure. And one statistic from the National Sleep Foundation says that approximately 61% of women experience sleep problems in menopause likely due to a variety of reasons, but Dr. Fulveri Schaefer, what would you say is that as, re as it relates to those hot flashes and night sweats? Yes, it, it may be in many women that hot flashes and night sweats are um, independent of any other sleep disorder, but for sure uh, they can cause awakenings and cause arousals. And perimenopause and menopause is a time already where women are very vulnerable to sleep disorder presentations. Uh, some of the most common sleep disorders escalate in their prevalence, prevalence significantly during those years. So this is, for example, the primary insomnias that often have triggers. So patients have an arousability at night, but there may be a trigger and a hot flash may be a trigger to that uh, that can lead to sleepless nights. Uh, similarly, restless leg syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, these are disorders that are common during this time frame, and having night sweats on top of it uh, just causes more awakenings and more prolonged time awake at night. And certainly sleeplessness can lead to not only physical health problems, but mental health problems and mood disorders. So let's talk a little bit about that. Can you talk to us, Dr. Yes. Vigara, about what that looks like of for course. many menopausal of women. Of course, so we know that women in general are two to three times more likely to suffer from depression, anxiety than men. And there's various theories to why that is, but in particular during periods of hormonal fluctuation, there appears to be a subset of women who are particularly sensitive to these hormonal fluctuations. And one particular time is the perimenopausal time, so the years right before menopause. We also see this during pregnancy and the postpartum as well as premenstrually. And so with respect to the perimenopause, there are various theories. One is called the domino theory, which I think you were alluding to, where women start having, you know, when they experience hot flushes at night, night sweats, they're not sleeping as well, and then the sleep disturbance leads to uh, poor mood. There's also psychological factors during this time period, especially in the menopause, when children may be leaving the household, there may be a change in role. Uh, the, um, often women are taking care of elderly, sick parents. 
So there's that psychological component as well. So we have the hormonal you know, subgroup that are sensitive to these fluctuations, the domino theory, and then of course these psychological components with the role transition. So lots of factors. Yes. And yes. Dr. Batur, I, I mean, I you, probably you've had the same experience. You talk to some patients and they're not at all bothered with hot flashes and other patients are, might change for them during different times of the year or months or what have you. Do you have any sense as to what certain triggers are? What's the underlying causes in some folks that have it more than others or different times more than others? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, estrogen levels are the same whether somebody's having these symptoms or not. So what is the difference? And there's some environmental factors probably, um, but the we, we don't have a good answer. But there are certain things in the lifestyle that we know can contribute. For example, um, caffeine, um, alcohol, uh, smoking, hot temperatures, uh, you know, exercising in heat, obviously. Um, but some of these stimulant type things uh, like the um, alcohol and the, um, or rather the um, caffeine and the smoking it can be big factors. Some women notice that if they do a lot of simple carbs in the diet, that they actually get a spike in their hot flashes for the few hours after. So it's actually important to kind of track, either mentally or just write down when you're noticing the worst of the symptoms. Because if you're trying to do this more holistically, think about, okay, I just had these really bad uh, flutter of hot flashes. What was I doing in the last you know, one hour? What was I thinking about? What did I eat? What did I drink? What was the environment? Um, we know stress makes it worse for sure. It's probably not a surprise. Stress doesn't make anything better. Um, but stress can be a pretty powerful uh, you know, aggravator of the mm -hmm. hot flashes too. And of course, it seems they always occur at the most inopportune time, right? You're standing there talking to your boss or somebody who's maybe very important in your life and whoosh, you're beet red, you're sweating, you get sweat dripping down your forehead and that embarrassment and that experience leads to more sort of stress and anxiety about it the next time. So Dr. Vigura, what are some tips you can guide us around? How do we cope with or how do we sort of self-regulate when right. we're about to lose right. regulation of our thermoregulator? Well, th there's, there's various approaches. There's pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. So some of the non-pharmacologic approaches include cognitive behavioral therapy, and there's been there's good evidence to suggest that that can be very helpful for vasomotor symptoms. And part of that is just changing your th your your thought process about what's going on. So that example that you gave, a lot of women may then start avoiding situations so that they're not in an embarrassing situation. And the cognitive behavioral therapy really gets at the your, your thoughts, your feelings, and then behaviors and tries to modify that, sort of reframe the situation. Um, and then there's a lot of pharmacologic uh, interventions, which I think we'll, we'll discuss maybe a little bit later, but with respect to the psychotropics, some of them have been very helpful, like some of the SSRIs, gabapentin, for instance, can help very much reduce some of the vasomotor symptoms. Not 100% like taking um, hormone replacement therapy, but to a significant degree. That's great. And any other natural approaches that either of you would comment on? Um, yeah, when people say natural, of course, the truly natural thing is to give your back body that estradiol that it's looking for. Mm -hmm. But I know we'll talk about that, especially if you're young, though. I just want to make sure we call that out at some point. Um, if you lost your estrogen at a young age, less than age 40 especially, um, or before age 45, you really need to be on the estrogen unless there's a true medical reason why you shouldn't be. That's the most natural way to address it in that situation. Um, but otherwise, people are always thinking about, like, what can I do in my diet? Are there supplements? And for diet, there are um, plant-based estrogen-like products, isoflavones, um, and, or phytoestrogens. And so these do sit on the estrogen receptor. They mildly activate the estrogen receptor, but it can be helpful. And they're usually a part of a heart healthy diet. So like chickpeas, lentils, soybeans, flaxseed, especially in ground form, um, ground up form, can be helpful. I mean, why not throw some into your salad, get some extra protein and see if it helps. As far as the supplements go, the North American Menopause Society has really looked, has done reviews and looked at which supplements are helpful, because it's a lot of products out there, making a lot of money, trying to sell a lot of stuff. And unfortunately, most of the products have not been shown to be more effective than placebo. Um, and 
the placebo effect in menopausal world is actually pretty high. It's about close to 50%. So that means that I give you a Tic Tac, put it in a nice bottle, so hike up the charge, you know, really sell a good story behind it. 50% of my patients are going to get symptom relief. So we really want to make sure that if you're putting something into your body, you're paying a lot of money for it, it's working better than a Tic Tac. Um, there are some products, like there's a black cohosh out of Germany that has some data behind it. Um, but, you know, we don't live in Germany, and so when you go on the web, you don't know what you're getting. Um, so unfortunately, the supplements, um, it's hit or miss. But I think if you want to do it naturally through the dietary approaches, it's, it's fine. And I just want to throw another... Um, uh, Plug. Plug. Thank you. Um, shout out for cognitive behavioral approaches because that really has been shown to clear placebo effect yeah. compared to sham studies. And just going, back, I don't. I'm not trying to dominate the conversation, but everybody wants to know about the natural stuff. Yes. So I want to spend a minute talking about all this. Yeah. Um, so the cognitive behavioral approaches, it totally makes sense that it was it would work because we know stress makes it worse. So if you have all this negative energy going to your hypothalamus mm -hmm. and it makes it worse, then why wouldn't positive energy make it better? Mm -hmm. So working with a good behavioral therapist, um, the British Menopause Society has a great article. Uh, if you Google British Menopause Society CBT menopause, they have a great way to teach yourself. There's apps to teach yourself these tricks if you don't have somebody skilled like Dr. Vergara in your um, in your region. And then the hypnotherapy has also been shown to do better than placebo. That's great. And mm -hmm. I would also reiterate what you said earlier about triggers, cutting mm -hmm. triggers out of your diet. Many women, in my experience, have a almost zero tolerance for alcohol as they transition through menopause. And it's something that wake up in the middle of the night, horrible headaches, sweating. They just have to really be careful about alcohol consumption, too. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also an important thing to reiterate. What other things with sleep, Dr. Fulveri Schaefer, would you say could be preventative for those hot flashes that wake us up at night? Yeah, there's some very simple strategies that we uh, we teach all patients who have sleep disorders, particularly the insomniacs uh, and women with, with hot flashes. Uh, things like, you know, temperature regulation in the rooms, sleeping in a cooler room. Uh, now you can buy pillows and bedding that are cooling, you know, cool to the touch. Uh, sleeping in light PJs, keeping socks off your feet. Um, using fans, uh, all these things really can lower the body temperature a little bit and which can induce sleep. Uh, also, we've got a form of cognitive behavioral therapy specifically for people who have poor sleep hygiene or insomnia. And Cleveland Clinic uh, Wellness website has a program called Go To Sleep, which is six weeks of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia that people can do at home. And these are, again, cognitive and behavioral strategies that get to the root of misperceptions related to sleep loss. And regardless of the cause of insomnia, CBTI uh, can be helpful uh, to induce a better night's sleep. That's, that's great to have that resource. Um, many women think that this is doomsday, right? Like this is gonna be what I have to deal with for the rest of my life. And we do know, st you know statistically, most women will have their worst symptoms in the first 24 months of menopause and perimenopause. Would you agree? Would you say it's longer? Let's talk a little bit about how long and what can we do to treat it. We'll start with you, Dr. Patur. Yeah, I mean, I used to quote, based on old data, most people it's gonna get better in five years, but it turns out for the average person it's gonna be seven. Mm -hmm. And for the ones that are super flashers, meaning you know they're younger, it's worse, it's gonna be closer to a decade, and some certain subgroups, uh, ethnicities might be at 12 years. So I'm hesitant to say grin and bear it because you might be looking at about a decade. And it might be that you're going to have the worst of your symptoms and it's going to become manageable. But that's why we kind of have to judge it year by year on how bothersome are these symptoms to you. So I think a lot of people, and we all have in our practices people who are in their 80s and they say, I'll never get rid of my hormone therapy yeah. because they feel miserable without it. Mm -hmm. um, and those, there's a small percentage of women that never get over them, but they do exist. So you're suggesting much longer than the two years that was sort of like the original theories and so why suffer even in those first couple of years right so what are some some sort of stepwise strategies that you would start with for treatment um so yeah i we I, talked about the plant-based exactly and the, the more natural stuff and i assume that's kind of where people like to start exactly medical yeah i was just going to say the same thing i usually say there's three-pronged approach there's a holistic approaches and then there's prescriptions that are hormonal or non-hormonal um, and really the gold standard would be 
meaning the most effective therapy, and until recently the most FDA, uh, the only FDA approved therapy um, was hormone replacement. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about, I know we're not really going too much into hormone therapy in this conversation, but look at all society guidelines, whether it's endocrine society guidelines, cardiology, whether it's, you know, um, uh, the North American Menopause Society, and they all say the same thing, that for women who are 40s and 50s, who don't have a medical reason not to be on hormones, that the risks and the benefits are favorable for most women. So that's an option, and I think people have to have a real conversation about the balanced risks and benefits, not just only talking about the risks. Um, and then non, we do have a lot of non-hormonal uh, non treatment options. Um, and I'll have them, because they use some of these medications just as much as I do in their clinic, but the antidepressants um, as a group, uh, SSRIs and SNRIs that she was mentioning, not every single one in that group, but several have been studied. Um, a bladder medicine called oxybutynin has actually pretty good data. Um, and then uh, Dr. Foldberry, which she uses in her practice a lot, gabapentin, um, pregabalin. Uh, these are old-fashioned seizure medicines that's pretty much used for anything except for seizure. Um, they have been shown to work much better than placebo. They haven't been compared to each other. Um, that's the downside, uh, but they do really seem to do a good job. Um, and if you just match up the side effect profile with, the, you know, for example, if something's sedating, if you use that in somebody who can't sleep, that's perfect. And then pretty soon, uh, we're going to have two other additional non-hormonal treatment options. Um, and these are specifically working on the candy neurons in the hypothalamus that we were talking about, that part of the brain. Um, one is expected to hit the market in the next month or so, and a second one hoping in 2025. Yeah, I, it's fantastic to have options mm -hmm. and to really individualize it based on each patient's symptoms and their response to those medications and the treatment options. And I would agree with you wholeheartedly. I have patients in my practice who are absolutely miserable in dealing with their menopausal symptoms. And they, they get this fear about hormone replacement therapy, but once they make that transition and realize how much better they can feel, the, their quality of life is so much improved. You know, you really do have to balance risks and benefits, benefits and have a conversation looking at the whole patient, the whole picture, and what their individual risks might be or risk of just having a miserable life because they can't sleep and they're having flashes all the time, the super flashers that mm -hmm. you mentioned, yes. Um, and you talked a little bit about the antidepressants, which can help hot flashes, but certainly the mood. And again, just getting back to the mood, Dr. Vigera, maybe you can speak a little more about the mood disorders that menopause can bring on in those transitions in life. So, so there's really sort of two groups of patients that we see, patients who experience new onset mood during these periods of hormonal fluctuation, like the perimenopause, or patients who already have a pre-existing mood or anxiety disorder. Those patients who already have a pre-existing mood or anxiety disorder are particularly vulnerable for worsening of their symptoms during these periods of hormonal fluctuation, like the perimenopause. So that would be a time to optimize whatever regimen has kept them well to sort of protect them as they sail through that uh, sort of hormonal tsunami of the perimenopause. Um, and so that's, that's really, uh, that's a, I see many of those patients who already have pre-existing mood disorders who are going through these periods of time. And uh, again, our strategy is, is like yours, multi-pronged, where we use CBT and also uh, medications as well. Because it's really the combination often of the antidepressant plus therapy that's most potent, most helpful. I'd like to thank my esteemed colleagues here, Dr. Vigera, Dr. Fuldvery Schaefer, and Dr. Batur. You know, 50% of the population will go through menopause and 100% of women will go through menopause. I tell my patients it's not a disease state, it's a stage of life. And we can certainly help you through this stage of life. There's lots of remedies, both natural and medical and pharmacologic remedies. To everyone watching, we thank you for joining us. We hope you've learned something that will help you as you na navigate through your own journey. And if you're experiencing menopause symptoms that are having a negative impact on your life, please make an appointment to speak with your primary care provider or your women's health specialist who can help you find a path forward. Thanks again for being with us here today.